Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody, for uh, and thank you for joining us for today's Health in Action work group. This is actually the last Health in Action work group of our 2024 series. Um, so thank you for joining us. My name is Emily Bear, and I'm one of the site engagement coordinators with MVC, and it's my pleasure uh, to be facilitating this work group for you today. To start... We're just gonna go over a couple of housekeeping notes. First, as you likely heard, the session is being recorded and that recording will be shared to you um, in the follow-up email that you'll receive after this work group um, is completed. Questions uh, will be held until the completion of our presentation today. We'll have a designated discussion opportunity after Jesse's presentation. And then lastly, at the end of our work group today, we will share the link to the post work group survey. Um, and you will want to complete that post work group survey um, to receive credit for your attendance to today's work group if you are attending for P4P credit. All right. And now on to our presenter. So Jessie DeVito is with us today. She is the Administrative Director of Hospital Care at Home, or HCAH, at the University of Michigan Health. She has spent the past 13 years at U of M Health and previously served as the Administrative Director of Virtual Care for the health system. Jessie joined the HCAH team in December 2023 in preparation for a successful February of 2024 launch of the program. And she's responsible for administrative, operational, and financial oversight of the unit, in addition to the execution of strategic priorities and expansion initiatives. Jessie earned her undergraduate degree from Cornell University and has a Master of Health Services Administration from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. So thank you for joining us today, Jessie. I will be progressing Jessie's slides for her. And here we go. I will turn it over to you, Jessie. Perfect. Thanks, Emily. And thanks for having me today. Um, I will start with an overview of our hospital care at home program. I'll talk a little bit about its history and sort of what it looks like today. And I'm happy to take any questions that uh, folks might have about it. So we can jump right in. Um, I'll talk a little bit about inclusion exclusion, uh, what actually the model looks like, some of the diagnoses that we see in it, how we're able to take care of patients while they're in their home. Um, and then I'll, I'll go through some of our current metrics and performance and then how we plan to expand the program into the future. So with that, we can jump to the next slide. A little bit of an overview of University of Michigan Health. So just for background, if anyone is not familiar, uh, the University of Michigan Health consists of our academic medical center, which is sort of the middle and right box below. So that's our inpatient hospitals and then our ambulatory care centers or our outpatient facilities. And that um, comprises our academic medical center. And then we also have a regional network of care that's on the left side of this diagram. And those are those partners uh, who we're either affiliated with or otherwise partnered with around the state of Michigan. And you can see that listed out in a bit more detail. I'll focus really today on the AMC and specifically our adult hospitals in the middle there. So you'll see University Hospital, the Frankel Cardiovascular Center. Those are considered our adult hospitals which is what hospital care at home operates out of. And then we'll soon be adding our inpatient pavilion. Um, it's the tower that's currently being built on our medical campus. And so we'll be adding that and eventually admitting patients to hospital care at home from there as well. Um, and our emergency department, which is one of our primary admission sites, sits in our university hospital. Uh, we don't currently admit patients from our children and women's hospital. So that's the one sort of uh, left out from that main medical campus that you're seeing in the center there, but we do plan to uh, eventually expand and you'll see that in some of the expansion efforts. Um, so that's just an overview and kind of where hospital care at home fits into the health system within um, our adult hospitals and really helping us to take care of 
those adult patients where we have a lot of capacity constraints in terms of the demand um, and the need for inpatient care and emergency care really exceeding what we can manage in our brick and mortar or physical capacity. And so that's really why hospital care at home exists, why it is what it is today. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Um, we can jump to the next slide. So a little bit about a little background about our hospital care at home program, specifically at U of M. So we actually, uh, prior to COVID uh, and the pandemic sort of um, inspiring CMS to issue the waiver that I'll talk about, uh, we actually had a homegrown program with um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and were admitting patients who needed inpatient level care in their homes starting back in 2019. So of course, pre-pandemic prior to the waiver, um, but we did then obviously expand beyond um, just a single commercial payer when um, we applied for and received the CMS Acute Hospital Care at Home waiver, and that was in early 2021. So at that time, of course, that enabled us to admit Medicare patients to the program and then other commercial payers uh, as likely in a lot of states sort of started to follow suit uh, as far as the reimbursement model for this model of care. So with that, um, we continued to grow our homegrown program and expand it beyond that initial commercial payer pilot, uh, but realized that we had some limitations from a logistics and management perspective, and so decided to partner and transition from that homegrown program to working with a vendor and the vendor that we utilize, there are a number of vendors in the space, but we utilize Medically Home Group. And so we partnered with them late in 2023 for a February launch of our expanded program. So uh, just eight months ago this year, <clears throat> we launched our expanded hospital care at home or what we call kind of version 2.0. And what that really does is allows us to admit higher acuity patients. So um, we can admit, we don't limit based on diagnosis, but we can we can admit to hospital care at home a broader patient population. Uh, we also have a lot more pathways for services that patients need while they're admitted to hospital care at home. So, of course, they're needing inpatient level services. And so we now have pathways that we didn't have previously to bring them back for services, let's say procedure, um, surgical, anything that they need in the brick and mortar. Obviously, there are a lot of things we can't do in the home, like MRI, CT, things like that, that we now have the ability to bring those patients back. And we have what we call a pathway to be able to do that. And we also have additional diagnostic and in-home um, testing and other services available so that, again, we can take care of those higher acuity patients and we can do more for patients in their homes. Uh, and then lastly, we have a 24 by 7 care team model, which you'll see in another slide where we have a virtual hospitalist team. So our Michigan Medicine MDs who are taking care of these patients virtually um, and they're available 24 by 7. The patients can access their care team. We I'm actually sitting in our command center right now, which is in Dallas, and we have a 24 by 7 virtual nursing team along with service coordination that's managing all the behind the scenes logistics to make sure that patients can be admitted to the program, get to their home safely, have what they need in home today, and then continue to be cared for um, throughout their stay, whether that's with point of care labs and testing and other things that they need, procedures in the home, additional services. And I'll talk about that whole kind of care model and how it revolves around the patient. Um, so we can jump to the next slide. So a little bit about what is hospital care at home. We always lead with this. Uh, there's still a lot of confusion and misunderstanding around this model. So the thing that we try to highlight the most is that we're still providing that integrated whole patient care. Just the venue of care is different and it's the patient's home instead of our brick and mortar. So when we admit patients to our hospital care at home program, they are inpatient. So they're receiving inpatient level care. Uh, just that care setting is their home. They can come to us in two different ways currently. So we, as I mentioned, we admit adult patients, but they can either come to us through our adult emergency department, uh, and that is a hospital substitution. So instead of being admitted to a floor, a patient is admitted directly from our ED to hospital care at home. 
The other way that they can come to us is through a reduced length of stay is what we call it. But that's really when a patient is already admitted and they're coming from one of our med surge floors. And we are, instead of admitting them, we are transferring them from the med surge floor to hospital care at home. So it's either an admission or a transfer. It is not a discharge, which is very important. A lot of times when we approach uh, primary teams about hospital care at home, one of the concerns that they tend to have is, this patient isn't ready yet for discharge. And so one of the things that we have to kind of clarify and explain to those teams who are not as familiar with hospital care at home and maybe haven't previously had a patient admitted to the program is that it's not a discharge. Your patient is still receiving inpatient level care. Um, It's not a completion at home pathway, which is one of our step down approaches from an inpatient unit. Um, And it's not outpatient care or home health. It is truly inpatient level care that just happens to be happening in the setting of the patient's home. Uh, So with that, I can jump to the next slide. And so I'll talk a little bit here about inclusion exclusion criteria, and we do kind of continually evolve those. So as mentioned, currently only admitting adult patients, we've had some interest from various pediatric services, but uh, don't tend to have the volume to support the care delivery in this model for those but hope that's something we can expand to in the future. We also are currently only admitting inpatients, and that is in part due to the acute hospital care at home waiver and the fact that CMS requires that they enter through one of those brick and mortar pathways that I mentioned, which is either via our emergency department or our med surge floors. Um, So we, and, and the reimbursement from CMS is limited to patients who meet inpatient level criteria. We are, however, exploring for those payers um, who will reimburse uh, if we deliver care to their beneficiaries um, in hospital care at home when they're in an observation status. We are uh, planning to begin admitting those patients because, again, as I mentioned, this is primarily a capacity management initiative for us, which means um, that Similar to admitting an inpatient, uh, admitting an OBS status patient to hospital care at home also saves us a bed in the brick and mortar for a patient who truly needs it. And some of our, not all, of course, just like inpatients, some of our OBS status patients, though, can be cared for uh, in the home setting if they meet all of the appropriate geography and payer criteria. And so what we mean by that geography and payer criteria is we only admit uh, patients who have an insurance that we know will reimburse. We don't want anybody to get a large out-of-pocket bill for this service. And they also have to be within a 25-mile radius of that main medical campus that I showed you in the first slide, because uh, logistically, we, one, have to be able to get them back to the hospital in a timely fashion. And um, two, we have a service provider network that is covering this geography. So we start with a 25 mile radius because anything larger than that can get a little bit unrealistic in terms of logistics, travel time, things like that, being able to um, take care of patients and deliver services in a timely and efficient manner. Of course, patients have to be willing. We always um, offer this as an option, but if they're not interested in receiving care, or they can't for some reason. Um, then we would, we would of course, the patient would be admitted to the brick and mortar as they would have uh, normally. And then they have to at least be able to get up and answer the door, be able to do some of their basic ADLs so that it is safe for them to be in their own home. We don't necessarily require them to have a caregiver in the home, but if they're not able to get up and answer the door, if they do need assistance with a lot of their ADLs, then Um, In some cases, we will ask that they have, whether it's a spouse, a family member, a caregiver who is in the home. Um, We also can offer home health aids and other services for patients who maybe want to be at home, can do most of their ADLs, but need just a little bit of assistance, for example, with bathing or something like that. We are able to offer home health aids as part of our hospital care at home. Uh, Right now, we can admit patients, of course, who are already receiving care if they're in a SAR, in a SNF. We're not able to admit those patients or if they require more frequent care than what we can deliver in the home. So tele, Q2 neuro checks, anything like that. IV drips needing titration like heparin. If they're on higher rates of oxygen so we can take up to 10 liters a minute nasal cannula, um, we can do oral, um, oral pain meds. We cannot do IV or intramuscular pain medications at this time. 
We can otherwise deliver controlled substances and narcotics as needed, but patients um, typically we try to transition to oral before they're admitted. Um, we usually won't take a patient if they're having an imminent OR procedure, but we can take a patient if they're having surgery in a few days, they can go home, come back, we'll transport them back for a surgical procedure, and then they can finish out their recovery at home when that's appropriate. And then, of course, suicidal, homicidal patients who don't have a safe home or are not safe to be in the home alone because we're not monitoring 24-7, of course, would also be excluded from the program. The next slide. These are some of the common diagnoses. I think that really makes it concrete. It's super helpful to see. We've taken a lot of septic patients, patients with infections like cellulitis. We've taken tons of upper respiratory pneumonia, COVID, flu. Um, patients with, we have a patient on service right now with diverticulitis, uh, intra-abdominal abscesses, patients who have drains and things like that. We can take osteomyelitis. Um, acute hypoxic respiratory failure. Again, we've taken, uh, right now we have a patient with acute exacerbation um, of their heart failure, uh, similarly COPD exacerbation. Taking a lot of rhabdo patients from the ED, interestingly, tend to be a younger population and really um, appreciate being able to get this care in the home. Uh, acute kidney injuries, uh, diabetes management, post-diabetic um, diabetic ketoacidosis. So Lots of different diagnoses that we can take. And so that's one of the reasons I mentioned we don't limit based on diagnosis. We limit based on other clinical criteria based on the care that we're able to deliver in the home, which is why we're able to take such a wide range um, of different diagnoses. Next slide. This is just a little bit of a visual of the care model, as I mentioned before. So one of the important components that I haven't mentioned yet is that we do have an intake team. So we have nurse practitioners and physician assistants who are reviewing constantly our eligibility list and our electronic medical records. So we have an eligibility list that funnels um, down to a lot of those inclusion criteria that I mentioned earlier. So if a patient meets geography, meets payer, meets basic clinical criteria, is not pregnant, not on hemodialysis, things like that, um, then our intake team will review that patient's chart they will go through a clinical screening tool to see if the patient is clinically stable enough to be admitted to the program. If the patient passes the initial clinical stability tool, then they'll review for social stability, things like does the patient have a home, do they have running water, electricity, all of the things that we need to be able to provide this care in the home. They'll also do a needs assessment to understand um, you know, are we able to get all the equipment that we need to get into the patient's home, for example, if they live in an apartment and the only entryway is a lot of stairs and things like that. So we'll go through all of that with a patient, of course, from a safety perspective prior to admitting them. Once they're in their home, we're required to visit the patient twice a day in person. A lot of those visits happen with our community paramedics. Some of them are otherwise managed by in-home um, nurses. They also have, as I mentioned earlier, that 24 by 7 access to their inpatient care team. And then in addition, the interdisciplinary care team includes our care managers, our clinical assistants who manage both of those teams manage a lot of the post-acute care needs of these patients if they have DME requirements and other things like that. Um, and then this, what you're seeing on the right is sort of the upper picture is the technology kit. So scale, blood pressure, cough, um, the phone that patients can use 24 by 7 to call the command center at any time. They have a personal emergency response device that they can press a button and it's sort of like one of those life alerts and contacts the, the command center immediately so that they can easily access. Let's say it happens super rarely, but in the rare instance that we had a patient fall, they could, they're generally wearing that personal emergency response device um, you know, either a necklace or a bracelet, and they can kind of click that button, contact the care team. They also have the tablet that you can see blown up a little bit on the right here, and that's showing their schedule. So that's saying, at this time, we're sending a courier to your home to drop off your medications. So you can expect your med delivery, and it's safe to open the door to that person. Uh, this is the time that your MD will be visiting with you later this morning. This is the time that um, you'll have a PT consult, OT, anything like that. So that tablet is letting the patient know who's coming into their home and when, or even who they're seeing virtually and when. 
And then you can see there, um, that is actually our command center here where I am in Dallas. And that is one of our virtual nurses um, working. And so they're constantly on calls, on video with the patient, checking in very frequently um, with our patients so that they have everything that they need. Next slide. This is just a different visual of that care model and just outlining some of the things that I haven't mentioned yet, but really with the patient in their home at the center of that care. And you can see all of the different services that we're able to bring in. So we can do stat IV access and labs if we need to. We have a mobile phlebotomist when necessary. Um, we can bring in skilled nursing, PT, OT, uh, nutrition, um, we can do a lot of mobile imaging in the home. So we can do x-rays and, and a limited set of ultrasounds. We can do pick lines, IV access, uh, stat lab draws, um, EKGs. If patients need a lot of our patients are on IV fluids and antibiotics. A lot of them are on oxygen, as I mentioned. And we also have a number of our specialty physician consult services available so that if a patient needs to be followed by transplant nephrology, needs to be followed by cardiology and infectious disease, we're utilizing all of those consult services the same as we would if a patient was in the hospital, just virtually. So all of these, we're bringing all of these different services um, to the patient in their home. So this is just a helpful visual to see all of that. And I did see that there is a question. Um, the in-home visits really can vary. Sometimes it's a quick five minute or less check-in. Other times a patient with complex med reconciliation, one of our nurses might be on for a bit longer. Um, so those are the in-home visits that are happening virtually with the nurse. The average in-home visit length for our primary in-home clinicians, which is typically those medics, as I mentioned, is a bit longer and similarly varies. Um, I would say it's usually at least 30 minutes, but I think our average is over an hour um, between one and two hours because a lot of times that visit includes an infusion. So if a patient has a, you know, a 90 minute, a two hour infusion, then that visit length um, increases quite a bit. So I would say they really are in that range from 30 minutes to two hours with the average being between one and two hours, which I know is a little bit broad. Um, we can jump to the next slide. Uh, these are, as I mentioned, so of course I didn't run through the whole list of consult services that we have available, but um, we continue to add consult services so that we're not limited as far as um, patients we can admit based on the consult services we have available. We don't have palliative care formally available to the question about those consult services, um, but we have utilized palliative care um, when we need for care planning goals of care. Um, we have utilized pa our palliative care team, and we do plan to formalize a geriatrics and palliative care um, consult also. Yeah, thank you. Great questions. Um, we can jump to the next slide just in the interest of time. Uh, this is a little bit of our data to date. So what you're seeing there on the left, I think just a helpful visual. Um, the red is our reduced length of stay. So those are the patients who are coming to us from our med surge floors. And the blue are the patients who are in that hospital substitution or coming to us directly from our emergency department. So you can see that we have a relatively even, it's almost uh, typically a 50-50 split. Um, and to date we've had, uh, we're inching closer now that we're almost in mid-October um, to about 300 admissions. Our highest census that we've gotten to is 10, although right now we're trying to aim for even higher than that. Our ADC has gotten up to about five, but that's since our February launch. So that's taking into account our early months when our census was fairly low and our average length of stay tends to hover around four days. Um, pretty typical month, what we've been seeing is between 40 and 50 admissions. And of course, month over month, um, we are working to try and increase that so that we can really inch up that ADC um, and manage those patients um, in their homes who are able to, so that we can help with some of that capacity. Uh, our in-home staffing skill mix does not include LPNs. It does include community paramedics though, to answer that question. Um, so it includes the in-home um, staffing as both our primary in-home clinicians are both community paramedics and um, RNs, but not LPNs at this time. Um, and so that's just a little bit of our data. We can jump to the next slide, which has a little bit um, of additional data about our quality uh, in the program so far. So I think one of the things that we report to 
CMS, but we would be tracking on anyway, is patients escalating to brick and mortar. And we're seeing that we're pretty steadily at a 10% rate of escalation. So that means a patient who needs a higher level of care, something that can't be delivered in the home, maybe they need to go and have an incision and drainage. So this is not for um, scheduled, you know, we know the patient needs a CT or an MRI. This is for a patient needs an escalation. They need a higher level of care. Um, we're seeing that at about 10%, which the industry standard is somewhere from 7 to 10%. Uh, but the way that we think about that is that that means that we're admitting the, high, the right level of acuity patients to the program. If we were seeing a much lower escalation of brick and mortar rate, we would know we're probably not taking sick enough patients into the program and patients who are um, the acuity that we want to be caring for to truly help offload our system capacity. Um, we also see that with hospital care at home, so you can see both return to ED within 30 days and then return to ED with an admission, um, an inpatient admission within 30 days, hospital care at home is lower than some of our med acute units. And then using um, that one individual gen med unit as a good comp to our hospital care at home program, uh, we are also lower in both of those uh, return to ED and return to ED with admission rates. Um, so, and that is similarly consistent with what we're seeing as a national trend. CMS just last week published a report on um, the data and outcomes from the acute hospital care at home waiver and similarly found lower rates of readmission, lower rates of readmission with admission, high rates of patient and provider satisfaction. And I'll get into some of our detail on those items too. Um, next slide. This is actually some of our feedback, both from our providers who participate in the program and also our patients. Um, so you can see this patient shared that the in-home care providers uh, were EMT, so they're technically community paramedics. Um, and some are nurses. This patient might have just not had any, um, any of their in-home visits with an RN, um, but had their two visits per day, said every single care provider they interacted with was stellar. They had really excellent care, very competent. Um, and we've had patients who have wanted actually to stay in hospital care at home. And we've said, like, really, you're ready for discharge. You don't still need to be admitted to this program. Um, so I think that's a great testament to how much patients like being able to be in their homes um, and, and receive their care this way. And then we had one of our attendings. So one of our virtual hospitalists who said, really enjoy this and can imagine that will only increase as I get used to it. You know, hospitalists are a very hands-on group. So I think it's a pretty significant practice change, but it's definitely something, and they don't do this all the time. They do this, you know, as part of their effort and have said that they really enjoy taking care of patients in this way and getting to see that full continuum of care and what it's like for patients while they're in their homes. Um, and what that would look like, you know, to when a patient is discharged, because that's typically where they're going and um, where they need to be able to continue to manage their own care. Uh, next slide. I think we have just a little bit more here. Um, so the way that we really tried to encourage provider engagement, that's been one of our biggest challenges is just educating about the program that it's not home health. It's not a discharge. Um, so within Epic, we have a lot of organizations use a home icon, which represents that a patient meets those basic eligibility criteria. So we try to encourage our referring clinicians um, to add that to their patient list so that they're seeing when a patient is potentially a good candidate for hospital care at home. We call it wrenching that into their list. That's how you add something to a patient list so that they can see that and it helps it be top of mind. And also we ask that even if someone's not sure if a patient's a great candidate, submit the referral to our team anyway. Our intake team will review those at 100% and they'll evaluate. So we don't want people to feel like they have to memorize the geography, memorize the clinical criteria. Our intake team manages all of that. And we say, just send us the consult and we'll take it from there. Um, for our primary team, so those teams who are taking care of patients either in the ED or on the floors, we just ask that they're responsive to us, that they consider the program, they talk about it as one of our sites of care so that if a patient's in the ED and they're likely being admitted, they know that you may be you may be asked, you may be admitted to our hospital care at home program because that's how we take care of certain diagnoses um, here in the health system. And then we also just ask because we are obviously a teaching organization that we're orienting our learners to this as a model of care because this truly is the future of how 
um, how we anticipate patients will receive their care. And so we ask that um, in the teaching setting that this is that um, we're educating our learners about hospital care at home as well. And just think home first is what we is really the ultimate goal um, from our perspective. And next slide. And then just a couple, this is just brief about our program expansion. And then I think this is probably the last one if there are additional questions. Um, so as I mentioned, planning to admit patients who are in an observation status um, who are appropriate and meet the other criteria for hospital care at home. We continually add to our in-home capabilities. So the services that we can deliver in home uh, like continuous infusion, we recently added a number of additional medications that we can infuse continuously in the home, um, being able to take patients who are on tube feeds and having all of their nutrition needs met while they're in the program. As I mentioned, adding to those available consult services. So we'll continue to add um, the remaining medicine specialties and then a number of our surgical specialties as well, who we want available to our patients. Um, we continue to expand our service provider network capabilities, so adding service providers who can go into the home to provide wound care, who can do lymphedema wrapping. We have a lot of patients who have that as a need when they're admitted. Um, we're also planning to implement some default pathways. So as I mentioned, when a patient has a certain diagnosis and they're being admitted or they are admitted, saying this is actually a diagnosis that we take care of in our hospital care at home program and having that be the first thing that's offered to the patient and just as a, this is how we take care of this um, here at Michigan Medicine. And then continuing to develop those additional care pathways. So we didn't launch with a ton of post-surgical pathways in place, but there is a lot of opportunity there for patients who have just had a procedure. Um, there are, we have peer organizations who are admitting patients directly, let's say from the PACU to their hospital care at home program. So that's something that as we have opportunity to expand and grow, um, we hope to explore in a little bit more detail. And with that, I think that brings us to our last slide, which is the video. And I won't, I won't necessarily ask us to play that, but I know everyone will receive these slides and follow up. And so if you're interested, you can watch the video just in the interest of time. It's a little bit long, um, but it's on YouTube. So it is available for anyone who's interested in viewing that after. But I will stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. I think I might just have a good dog picture uh, just for good measure. But so this is actually not a patient. It's um the mother-in-law of one of the members of our intake team who was willing to do this video shoot with us. But you can see she's in the home with the medic, um, her dog, of course. And you can see the tablet in the background with her schedule pulled up. And then she is on a video call with one of our nurses in the far right. So it's just helpful to see sort of this is what this is what the kit, the technology looks like in a patient's home when they're sitting in their comfy chair and have their dog and um, all of their other kind of comforting items around them. So it's just helpful, I think, to have a little bit of a visual of what the whole what the whole setup looks like in the home. That I did. Thank you so much, Jesse. That was wonderful. And we will definitely be sure to share the slides that Jesse just reviewed, um, as well as I will include the link to that video directly in the email as well as for easy. I know we had a couple questions come through chat, which Jesse already addressed quite smoothly. Presentation. <laughs> Thank you anyone would like to unmute themselves, you're welcome to do so. Or if you would prefer to write it into the chat, we can also just read them out loud. Let's see, we just got one. Um, is the patient the same as if they were inpatient in a brick and mortar facility? Yes. So it is billed the same normal inpatient stay. So we bill, you know, DR it's billed and then to reimbursed the same as for right. question was um could you please share any barriers to implementation um that other health systems probably some of the biggest are 
um, particularly if you're a larger health system like we are, it is a culture change. Even though we had a hospital care at home program previously, it's still very different. And even if, you know, we've tried by having an intake team with brick, we refer to the program we've as possible for them to do it and consistent with their normal workflows but it's still challenging and it will still feel like it's extra work and you know then the bedside nurse still has to know when the patient is in the bed and when they're leaving and when they can have the room cleaned and everything like that so it will still feel like it's extra work to teams even though it is actually taking a patient off of their unit um, potentially in a lot of cases so um, the cultural change, the need for communication, education, and re-education is really significant. And as I mentioned, there still tend to be a lot of misconceptions around um, viewing it as a discharge service or program, viewing it as home health, confusing it with other. We also have our own home health um, programs and services, so there's a lot of confusion with that. So I think that um, is probably the single biggest challenge that we've had. And then we utilize uh, Medically Home as a vendor because there is so much logistical management that goes into this. So the twice daily visits and then all of the other patient needs um, that we have to meet as part of this program. And there are challenges that you don't think of when you're in the brick and mortar setting. So of course, in the brick and mortar setting, sometimes a patient might get their meds a little bit late, um, but you're not dealing with um, you know, pharmacy having to put those meds on a cart fill and then a courier having to pick up those meds and then maybe getting confused when they find when they get to the patient's home and they're not able to find, you know, if it's in an apartment building or something else where it's a little bit more challenging to find the home. Um, so just all of the different, there are a lot more uh, logistics hurdles that you have to clear, which is obvious and probably makes sense to anybody. But um, But that's just something that um, that is, you know, we try to compare and be as comparable as we can to the brick and mortar, but there are a lot of logistical hurdles to clear too. Have you guys been able to demonstrate um, cost savings for the uh, the payers or for the institution? And um, how are you getting the physicians to engage? Are, are they making home visits or are they televisits? Yeah, so... Um, the first question, I'm sorry, the first question, can you repeat that? Yeah, cost savings. Yes, yeah, so the cost savings question, the short answer is that um, you have to be at a higher ADC than what we currently are to really see the shift start to happen from an ROI perspective. Um, and really the cost savings is not in this model and the care delivery, but it's in the backfill of your brick and mortar beds and being able to backfill those patients who you've taken, um, who you've removed from the brick and mortar and taken into hospital care at home. Um, so it, it typically the break even and, and our analysis tells us that that would be when we get to an ADC of about 20 um, before we start to see the, the at least the break even from a, a cost perspective on the program. Um, of course, that might not be the same for everyone. Um, and we kind of continue to do that analysis as we have more data about the costs of delivering care in the home to patients. Um, but that tends to be um, a pretty solid number for when we would get to a break even. Then the other question, um, so our virtual hospitalists who are leading the patient's care from a physician perspective are only seeing the patients virtually. So they, in our former program, um, our MDs were actually doing in-home visits, but we have transitioned. They are exclusively providing care to the patients virtually in this new model. That's a great question. Right, so we had another question in the chat for you, Jesse. Um, first, Irene says, thank you. Um, and she's also curious, um, because she can see how for some patients, this would be a very satisfying experience. Um, how long did the planning stage take before the first patient was admitted to this program? Yeah, so I can answer that for 
know, but with a bit of a caveat. So we um, signed a contract and launched implement planning in July of last year. And our um, new version of the program went live in late February. So that was a very to eight month timeline. Um, mm -hmm. But we also had experience from our previous program where I don't think that would have been feasible. I don't um, I don't think it would have been feasible to do it in under a year without having the we have so I think it depends on those two things sort of do you have prior experience and then what is your appetite for sort of that rapid implementation we had to um you know we had to clear plates for a lot of our IT resources um we had to get engagement from a lot of our dis different <coughs> diagnostic and ancillary services <coughs> so it is a fairly significant uh time commitment <laughs> Lovely questions, everybody. All right. Were there any other questions um, for Jesse? Okay, great. I'm going to just review a couple of upcoming MVC events with you. Um, so Upcoming the rest of the month of October, and we've got our sepsis work group on October 17th. Um, that will be a presentation from Akil Vijay from Garden City Hospital. We're looking forward to that one. And then later this month, uh, MVC is hosting its fall collaborative wide meeting on October 25th. We hope to see many of you there. Um, that will be hosted at the Vista Tech Center in Livonia, Michigan from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And as always, our work groups are at 12 o'clock noon. All right. And that concludes our Health in Action work group today, the final for this series. Um, and we will drop the link for that survey in the chat. And we'll also include that in the follow-up email if anybody is calling in and unable to grab that link. All right. Thank you again, Jesse. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to present for us. We hope this was a, an interesting topic for everybody as much as it was for us. Thank you. Thank you.